Hello everyone and welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. If you missed the last installment, check out Seeds of Reformation, John Wycliffe. And if you want to read it for yourself, you can get my book, Just Tell Me the Truth About Christianity, from Amazon on paperback or for your Kindle. Today we're talking about the birth of the Protestant Reformation. Ironically, it was only about a hundred years after Jan Hus was murdered that the famous German monk and doctor of theology Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. During the century leading up to Martin Luther's protest, many things had happened in order to set conditions for the explosion of lasting change that came about from his challenges to the church. In 1440 AD, for example, the movable type technology for the printing press invented by Johannes Gutenberg allowed printing of books on a mass scale. Whereas it took a monk or scribe between nine months and one year to hand copy a Bible, Gutenberg made 200 alone in the year 1455, his famous Gutenberg Bible. It seemed that the printing and translating of Bibles began to further outpace Rome's ability to burn them. Contrary to the mainstream historical narrative, Gutenberg's Bible was not the first item to come from his new machine, but indulgences were printed for the church. When he did print his Bibles, Gutenberg took the safe route of printing the Catholic's Latin Vulgate as translated by Jerome in the 4th century. For as much trouble as it caused, Wycliffe's translation had been from the Latin texts as well, although some historians don't think they were the same manuscripts that were used in 382 AD by Jerome. The way the machine was used is really what was revolutionary. It existed in other parts of the world, but with his, Gutenberg placed an advertisement in the paper and went into business, offering his services. Eventually, it would be the entrepreneurial spirit being viewed as a positive attribute that would cause the West to explode into advancement on the world stage, and as a consequence, Christianity along with it. By contrast, in China, the printing press was used for imperial documents and Ming Dynasty propaganda. The Ottoman Turks banned the use of the machine in their territories, by that time, most of the thinkers in the Reform movement knew well that the Bible itself had been written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. This was not really a secret. The Jews had long ago perfected the Old Testament and had a strong line of provenance for their sources. Original New Testament manuscripts had been written in Koine Greek and were used as the source for New Testament scripture by what became Eastern Orthodox Church in Constantinople. In fact, it was the final fall of Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire in 1453 AD, that also prepared the way for the Protestant Reformation. As a result of the sacking of the city by Ottoman Turks, the scholars, theologians, and university-level teachers from Byzantium ended up migrating into Western Europe to escape the savagery with their lives. Those same teachers brought thousands of Greek texts and scriptures to the universities of Western Europe with them. George Hermonymus of Sparta was the first to teach Greek at the University of Sorbonne in Paris. Among his students was Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam, who would turn the Western world on its head by producing a new copy of the Greek New Testament. This type of work certainly took place in more than just the room of Erasmus. It was his, though, that rose to prominence at some point, perhaps because it had a few unique features. Erasmus's work featured two columns per page, with the Greek verses on one side and the same verses in Latin on the other. Moreover, Erasmus found the Vulgate translation so poor that he completely retranslated the Latin for this particular project, too. Erasmus was, after all, best known for his mastery of Latin, not entirely common for Catholic priests of the time. His Greek New Testament was, in fact, 
not his most popular work, which filled ten folios even during his time. Admittedly, the conspiratorial idea that he wrote with resentment bound and determined to undermine the papacy is not the full picture. People tend to forget that he was a Catholic priest. Letters exist in which he actually wrote to a colleague in the church asking to compare his work to their texts. Nothing survives to indicate that this occurred. He did later cave to pressure in subsequent editions of the work to include the Comma Johannium, the Trinitarian edition to 1 John 5-7, that he had decided not to include because it did not appear in any of the texts he critically compared to compile his work. Nothing showed that verse which seemed to come from a 4th century sermon. Once again, it was the time of the Reformation and Counter-Reformation that the words plainly spelling out this Catholic doctrine appeared. Comma Johannium aside, with Erasmus's New Testament, a whole new way of understanding the scriptures developed. It was not a loose new thinking that led the process of improving what scripture says, but a better ability to read and discern the older Greek texts. No Western Latin scholars had ever even seriously studied a Greek manuscript for that purpose before the 15th century, well over a thousand years since Jerome had translated the Latin Vulgate. In fact, in a gesture that was not loaded with resentment toward Rome as some Protestants have liked to reframe it, but sincere desire and hope that he would improve the church, an admittedly egotistical tact by a man held in high regard for his intellect, Erasmus dedicated his Greek New Testament to Pope Leo X, writing, quote, I perceived that teaching which is our salvation was to be had in a much purer and more lively form if sought at the fountainhead and drawn from the actual sources than from pools and runnels. And so I have revised the whole New Testament, as they call it, against the standard of the Greek original. I have added annotations of my own in order in the first place to show the reader what changes I have made and why, second, to disentangle and explain anything that may be complicated to the reader, ambiguous or obscure. Further, Erasmus pled with his readers to reserve judgment until they had read, understood, and studied the whole thing. That statement was clearly aimed right at the Catholic clergy who would likely rejoice in secret and lose their minds publicly at what Erasmus had uncovered and reinterpreted from Jerome's work. Erasmus argued that based on the fact that Jerome cannot have had the breadth of information and understanding when he made the Vulgate, that he could not have thought or expected that his Vulgate was a complete, true translation without having even seen any of the Greek. In fact, even to Catholic scholars of the time, it was quite clear that the Vulgate had taken many liberties, although certainly unintentionally, compared to the Greek. Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to continuing this topic in the next video. In the meantime, please visit Amazon to look at my catalog of books, or you can look at the channel trailer to see about other Truth First Christianity Evangelist Nick Garrett products that you can buy. I appreciate your support, and I look forward to talking to you next time when we continue the discussion about Erasmus, we take a look at the Renaissance papacy, and then Martin Luther. Have a good one.